Okay, this is chapter 12, part A, or part 1, and it's dealing with the central nervous system. Remember, the central nervous system is comprised of the brain and the spinal cord, just those two components. Uh, cephalization refers to the evolutionary development of the anterior portion of the central nervous system. What results from this? Well, you have an increased number of neurons, and you have the highest level that's reached in the human brain. And this just shows, um, if we start over here on the left, the neural tube, as it's during, this is showing during embryonic development, <coughs> how it begins, and then you start to see, uh, looks like little swellings that will eventually uh, later continue to grow and develop until we get the different components of the brain. So this upper portion um, in an adult brain, this is going to respond or correspond to the cerebrum, the highest level uh, functioning occurs here. This section right here is going to be the diencephalon, the brain stem in this section right here, and then down here is going to be the spinal cord. We are going to study each of these components or parts of the brain in detail. Now, during embryonic development, the brain grows faster than the surrounding skull. So in order to fit inside the skull, it has to start to fold around. And that indeed is what happens. So remember how initially it was uh, just a tube and then start, you start to see those swellings. But the skull is around here. So this is inside the skull. If it's growing faster, that's why it has to kind of start to fold back on itself in order to fit in this. It's in a confined space. <coughs> and this shows here that the cerebral hemispheres will develop. Um, and they, they start to develop around, as you can see, the outline that's embedded in here. So the diencephalon is in the interior portion of the brain. The, the cerebrum, is, as we'll see in a moment, is divided into two hemispheres, and they surround the diencephalon because this is all folded around. The adult brain is divided into four different regions. You've got the cerebrum, the diencephalon, the brain stem, and then the cerebellum. Now, some of these, such as the brain stem and the diencephalon, have um, smaller components within them, or you know, they can be divided even farther away or smaller. And so this is showing, as you can see right here, the main portion, majority of the mass of the brain is uh, the cerebrum. As you can see, it's listed as cerebral hemispheres because it is divided into two parts. The diencephalon, which is in the more interior portion. And then what's green here, that is your brain stem, which is actually divided into what's known as the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. And then down here is your cerebellum. As we study uh, the central nervous system, we'll talk about uh, gray matter and white matter. Remember, gray matter is containing the neural cell bodies, the somas, and unmyelinated neurons. The white matter is myelinated, and it will also have some non-myelinated axons. But remember that myelination gives uh, that whitish color because of the lipids. Something just to kind of keep in the back of your mind as we talk about the white and the uh, gray matter is what's the orientation of it. So if you did a cross section of the spine, this is what it looks like. Your white matter is mostly superficial, mostly on the outside. And interior is where you're going to find, you know, deeper inside here, the gray matter. If you move up to the brain stem, that connection between the spinal cord and the brain, uh, you still have the white and the gray matter, this central cavity here. Um, 
the distribution of the white and the gray matter is starting to change. The main one I want you to do is to compare the spinal cord to the brain itself. When you look at, uh, now this is showing the cerebrum, but you also see it in the cerebellum as well. Notice there's been a switch. The gray matter is now on the surface and the white matter is in the deeper interior section. There are ventricles located in the brain. Uh, these are filled with fluid. Um, they, each of these ventricles are chambers. There's four of them, they connect to each other. The fluid that in, that's in it is your cerebral spinal fluid, the CSF. And so the, because the chambers are connected, you'll notice there is kind of a flow pattern as it will drain uh, the first, sometimes they're called the uh, first and second ventricle, they're lateral, there's a pair of them, so there's lateral. Those will flow into the third ventricle, which flow into the fourth ventricle. <coughs> now, the lateral ventricles, they are connected to that third ventricle by the interventricular form. Uh, where is this third ventricle? It's in the diencephalon. And then the third ventricle is connected to the fourth by the cerebral aqueduct. The cerebral aqueduct becomes continuous with the uh, central canal and the spinal cord. Uh, there are some openings that do connect that fourth ventricle to the subarachnoid space that's surrounding the brain. So you've got an anterior view and the lateral view here. So if we look at the anterior view first, here are the lateral ventricles, the first and second one if you're counting them that way. You notice that they look like a C. So they are embedded in each of the cerebral hemispheres. And then they are connected, as you can see on this lateral view here. So here's the uh, uh, lateral ventricles. They are connected to that third ventricle, which is down here, or shown here, by the interventricular form. And then the third ventricle is connected to the fourth ventricle, which is down here, by the cerebral aqueduct. So you can see that the cerebral spinal fluid uh, can flow all the way down here. And then the fourth ventricle is connected. It's continuous with the central canal that's in the middle of the spinal cord, and it will flow down. That cerebral spinal fluid is helping to protect the brain. It acts as a lubricant. It also, um, it, it should not have any microorganisms in it. Um, it, it acts like a shock absorber, as we'll see later that um, both the brain and spinal cord have the, the fluid around it, the central uh, canal of the spinal cord, we'll see that the cerebral spinal fluid flows down it and then back up along the sides of the spinal cord. Um, kind of think of your brain is got this fluid around it and that helps to absorb any shock, uh, shock waves from, to reduce trauma. Like if you were to be, if you received a blow to the head, that the fluid is going to absorb a lot of that um, momentum of that force. We'll look at the cerebral hemispheres first. Uh, the cerebrum, as I mentioned just a bit ago in the picture, accounts for most of the brain mass, <coughs> over 80% of it. There are different markings on the brain, and of course we're going to give them different names. So the ridges are known as a gyri, the salsa are a shallow group, and then a deeper group is going to be called a fissure. There is a longitudinal fissure. This is a major uh, fissure, a very deep group that does separate the two cerebral hemispheres. And then there is a transverse cerebral fissure that does separate the cerebrum and the cerebellum. So in this picture here, you're uh, looking down on the, the brain. So here you've got the anterior, here's the posterior. 
All of this is the cerebrum. This deep groove right here, that is the longitudinal fissure. So you have your two uh, hemispheres. Now, South Psi will divide each one of the hemispheres into five different lobes. There is a frontal lobe, parietal lobe, temporal lobe, occipital lobe, and then the insular lobe. Now, most of these you can hopefully by now figure out where they are because of their name. So the frontal lobe is going to be, guess what, in the frontal region. The parietal lobe, as you can see, is outlined right here. The occipital lobe, hopefully you're looking at the back. And then the temporal lobe, look at the, the side here. Here's your uh, cerebellum. So this is also showing really well right here is that transverse uh, cerebral fissure that separates all of this is the cerebrum from the cerebellum right down here. And then this right over here is your brainstem. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so this is showing uh, the gyrus, which is the ridge, a small groove is the celsus, and then the deeper ones are the fissures. And if you're trying to figure out, okay, so where's that fifth lobe? Where's the insula? Um, it's underneath basically the part of the frontal and temporal lobe. So you'd have to look beneath there, and that's where it is here. So each hemisphere you can divide into regions. You've got the cerebral cortex. By now when you see cortex, hopefully you're thinking, oh, okay, that's got to be the superficial layer, and indeed it is. It's that uh, gray matter, as we've seen, is on the, the surface with the brain. It also is going to have a region where the white matter is, which is going to be deeper, central. And then there's what we call the basal nuclei, which is very deep embedded within the white matter. And so once again, you can kind of see here, you've got the cortex, and then the white matter is down here. The cerebral cortex, um, that's where a lot of your awareness, your sensory perception, uh, communication, memory storage, understanding, that's where a lot of this is located. It is a superficial layer, very thin, only two to four millimeters, uh, <coughs> because it is gray matter. It is composed of your neuron cell bodies. It has a lot of those supporting glial cells, has obviously a lot of blood vessels, but there are not axons in this area. You don't certainly don't have the myelinated axon. This comprises about 40% of the mass of the brain. We can determine from functional imaging um, of the brain using like a PET scan or MRI been able to determine where different functions are located, and we call those domains. Higher functions are spread over many areas. We certainly have been able to figure out, in general, where the motor and sensory functions are. So if you look, this is from a functional uh, MRI, looking at the cerebral cortex, and you can see here the different Areas highlighted. This is back in the occipital lobe here. Um, basically, what this is telling us is this is where a lot of the information for vision is, interpreting that information. And it's a lot more of just saying, oh, that's a book. Um, it's going to be. Related to what am I seeing? It's going to draw upon memories to help you identify what it is. Hearing is more in the temporal lobe. And with hearing, there's a lot of things that go along with that. Are you just hearing sound? Can you understand what's going on? Speaking is also in the temporal lobe. It's got to work with the hearing. Thinking, notice how widespread it is. 
Um, there was just FYI, a, a very interesting study done years ago, and I remember reading the, the paper, and it's always kind of stuck with me because I thought it was kind of interesting, um, where they did a, a study, similar to this, where they could look at the functional neuroimaging and see what areas were highlighted. That indicates that's the area of the brain that you are using at that particular moment. And it was a study where they compared um, men versus women. And, oh, surprise, surprise, we use our brains differently. And this is very generalized, okay? So this isn't true 100% of the time. There are exceptions. But just very generally, what they found was that um, oftentimes when men were given a task or told to think about something, or to do something, and they were able to monitor what area of the brain was activated. Um, it tended to be very, very localized, very strong response, but very localized just in one area of the brain. <coughs> so, ignoring this orange hair, you know, maybe it was just highlighted just in this area, which they were interpreting that as. Um, the individual was given a task and they will put all their attention on that one task. Now when they asked women to do the same thing, the, the same type of task, what they found is that area was not as highly stimulated. But there were multi, this is basically kind of what it looked like. It was all over in the brain where things were basically lighting up and what they interpreted that as and like I say this is very generalized is that they felt in the study this was giving uh, some credence some support to the idea that majority of women are good at multitasking you can be trying to review your AMP while you're cooking dinner, while you're trying to keep one kid from destroying the house and another kid working on, focused on his math homework and trying to remember, wait, I've got laundry in the washer and I've got a meeting at 8 o'clock. And, and you're able to multitask. Which at time, and, and there's pros and cons for this. There's times when it's good to be able to multitask, but are you putting your full attention to each of those individual tasks? No, and sometimes you don't have to be. <coughs> so it was saying that, that women in general tend to be uh, better at multitasking. Does that mean? And like I said, I don't mean to insult anyone. Does that mean that men can't multitask? No, this is a generalization. Now, like I say, there's a time and place for everything. Yes, there's times when you have 20 different things going on and you're trying to keep all of it going. You don't have to have all of your attention 100% on a single project. You can have 10% here and 10% there and 5 here and, and everything ends up getting done you know an hour later you've got supper on the table the house is not destroyed the clothes are in the dryer uh the kid finished his math homework and you're going to have your supper done and be able to go to your meeting at eight o'clock and everything works out that's fine what they felt from the majority of the males being able very strong focus in one area okay they're not multitasking but they have a hundred percent of their attention on the task at hand and there are times when that's what you want um a couple of years ago i had knee surgery i want that surgeon to have a hundred percent of his focus on my knee while he's doing surgery on it I want a pilot who's flying a plane to be focused on flying that plane and not be distracted by 20 other things. So there's a time and a place for everything. I thought it was kind of interesting. Number one, I think it's fascinating that they can measure all this. Um, but to show, you know, what most of us have known all along is that in general, you know, 
male and females, we think differently. Um, another just quick side note on that also is that in that same study they did some other work and I remember one specific thing that came out um, had to deal with giving directions and they said in general males will give direction using compass terms go two miles east turn north continue 1.2 miles and then you're going to turn west that they give those type of directions versus females who tend to give more descriptive directions of oh you go down the road until you see the the blue house with the white picket fence with the oak tree out front and then turn left don't ask me if it's north south east or west you turn left and then, oh, you go down until you hit, you know, uh, Uncle Joe's donut shop. And then you're going to take a right. And um, I know, goodness, I know in my personal life that is so, so very true. Um, but once again, it was just kind of a, an interesting thing. That sometimes people say, how can we don't know more about how the brain works? Number one, the brain is very, very complex. We are constantly learning more and more things. Certainly over the past, you know, 25, 30 years, we have realized initially so much research was done looking at males. And we can't do that. We need to have, if you're really going to do good research, you have to look at both males and females. You have to look at different age groups because uh, the brain is, is developing. And so... Um, we're, we're learning more and more. We're also, there's just a lot we don't know yet. When you are looking at the cerebral cortex, uh, you have to think of a couple things. It has three different types of functional areas. You're going to have motor areas that involves voluntary movement. It's going to have sensory areas where you become consciously awareness of a sensation, whether it's vision, smell, pain, whatever. Association areas, that's where you have a lot of information coming into the brain and you have to analyze everything that's coming in and interpret it before you can send out a response to the motor area. Each hemisphere is controlling the opposite side of the body and that's known as contralateral so the left side is controlling the right the right side controls the left lateralization or specialization um, sometimes occurs only in one hemisphere so there are certain areas of the brain where it might only be in the left hemisphere or only in the right conscious behavior is going to involve the entire cortex in some way or another spread out the motor areas tend to be located in the frontal lobe so if there was uh, injury and damage done to the frontal lobe that's going to affect affect your ability um, to respond to stimuli then um, now this goes into <coughs> excuse me um, a little bit more detail here but know that the motor area is in that that um, frontal lobe the primary motor cortex uh, is in this pre uh, central prefrontal area the very very front of the they, they kind of divide the frontal lobe itself into is it in the middle is it the prefrontal which would be way in the very very front portion of it the brocus area is in here and you have um, the frontal eye field is going to be in front of the brocus area so oftentimes when they talk about the free prefrontal area, it's right in here. Now you can see where they have been able to determine um, more extensively in terms of, okay, this area right here is working memory for spatial task. Uh, solving complex multitask problems is going to be right here. Working memory for object recall task is right here. So 
from that standpoint, everything say for working memory is not in one area. You're going to spread it out to different locations. This right here is the Broca's area. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And then here's the Wernicke area. This, and we'll come back to some of this again. But visual tends to be back here in the occipital lobe area. Auditory is here. Taste is going to be right down here. And then your somatic sensations, so sensory. Here's that central salsus that comes down here, kind of dividing front and back. Um, so this tends to be all motor, and then sensory is back here behind that central salsus. It's like a dividing line. The primary somatic motor cortex area is um, the precentral. Like I said, just right in front of that uh, central gyrus there. Now, this is a map that they use. Um, I know it looks really strange, but it, the idea behind it is that it shows you where different areas of the brain, what they are involved with, either picking up sensory information or controlling the motor response to that area. So if you look at the brain right here, <coughs> excuse me, if you did a cut right here, it's showing the motor area here in red. So here's your um, central salsus, that little smaller groove. Here is your lateral fissure. So it's showing that like this area right here, you could correlate, okay, right on the end here is the hip, but then here's the trunk, here's the shoulder. Fingers have a much larger area for controlling. Look at the area for the face for swallowing, etc. And over here it's showing the same thing for sensory. <coughs> the premotor cortex helps to plan the movements. It controls very learned and repetitions movements. It's going to coordinate very uh, simultaneously so you can have several things happening at once or things happening in a sequential order. But it is controlling voluntary <coughs> actions. It is responding to the sensory information that has come in and then been interpreted. That Broca's area that I showed you on the previous diagram, it's only in one hemisphere. It's usually in the left side. And it's involved with speech. Um, it's basically allowing you to speak, planning that activity of speaking, but right in front of it is a frontal eye movement that controls some of your, your eye movements, left to right, etc. So here is that, the Broca's area right here. And then this is a parasitical view of, <coughs> excuse me, the area, the still in the cerebrum. Now, if you have damage, like I said, if you had some type of a head trauma and there was damage in the primary motor, uh, motor cortex area ahead of that central cell, what usually happens is um, you're going to be paralyzed on the opposite side of the body. So if you had damage on the left uh, primary motor cortex area, then you're going to have problems moving the right side of the body. Uh, how does this damage occur? Maybe you're in an accident. Uh, sometimes a stroke. Uh, stroke is when you have interruption of the blood supply to the brain. And actually, if someone has a stroke, that can be a clue to us as to where in the brain it occurred by what they cannot move. Can they not move their hand? Can they not speak? Can they? That, that gives you clues. And obviously, if the damage, they can't move their the right arm, then that tells you the damage from the stroke occurred on the left side of the brain. So you use all of these little things to kind of help you with diagnosis sometimes. <coughs> um, now, sometimes, depending on how extensive the uh, damage has 
been and how long it's been before you can start the diagnosis and therefore start treatment. Sometimes other areas can kind of take over. It's going to take a lot of rehab, so you have to practice. Um, it, it's kind of like learning all over again. Um, all of you probably have heard stories, hopefully not personal experiences with it, you know, of where someone has been in a very extreme, horrific accident. And um, the damage that has been done, number one, you have to get the patient stabilized. Um, my, my brother has a, a friend, somebody he knew, he went to high school with, a uh, very nice kid. Um, was after college was working with his dad in construction and they were working on a building and he was up on the scaffolding and the scaffolding collapsed he fell the equivalent of it was either three or four stories that he fell um severely critically injured the only thing that saved his life was the fact that the building they were working on uh, and where the scaffolding fell was a hospital and literally he fell right outside the emergency entrance. So you can't get much quicker than that to get help. Um, and he, he survived, he's fine, but it's a very, very long road for recovery because first in his case he had so many broken bones you have to x-ray make sure do you have to reset some of the bones are they positioned properly let the bones heal uh, stop obviously any internal bleeding is the first thing you do um, which he had to have some surgeries to stop internal bleeding they set the bones let the bones repair uh, and then slowly, work. I mean, he had to learn to walk again. He had to learn to do so many things over again. So other areas of the brain can kind of take over, but only to a certain degree. The sensory areas tend to be behind that uh, central sauces. <coughs> they... The sensory areas let you, um, basically you're aware of the sensation. You are aware of uh, light touch. You're aware of deep pain, etc. They tend to be in the parietal, insular, temporal, and occipital lobes, so they're not in the frontal lobe. And they divide them into different areas. Um, the primary somatic sensory cortex the somatic sensory association cortex and now that's by the name alone should start to tell you okay initial information is coming into the primary somatic sensory somato tends to refer to like voluntary uh, conscious awareness of things so you stick your hand on a sharp object that's going to go to the primary somatic sensor ooh pain uh, the association areas where you're going to be interpreting. So just by looking at these names, start putting things together. Oh, okay. So I bet you the information first comes to the primary somatic sensory cortex. Then it's got to go to the association cortex for that to interpret what is all this that I'm, I'm information that's coming in. You have visual areas. You have auditory areas, auditory hearing. Vestibular cortex area, olfact vestibular is going to be hearing also. Olfactory, smell, gustatory is taste. Visceral sensory, visceral tends to refer more to like your abdominal pelvic organs, those internal organs, um, and picking up sensations from them. So that primary somatic sensory cortex. You're receiving all that sensory information from the skin, from the proprioceptors. You're capable of identifying the region of the body that's being stimulated. Is it your hand or is it your foot? So once again, you see these diagrams where you can see exactly is it the knee versus um, your, your tongue. 
you just ate hot pizza. Well, this is going to be the area stimulate, not over here where you know, the sensory neuron goes to. Understanding of seeing an object, say, and understanding what that object is, being able to determine what's the size of it, what's the texture of it, how if you're seeing several different objects, the relationship of one to another, uh, that's going to be occurring in your association cortex areas. Um, relationship of parts of objects, you know, that you're, you're feeling. It's as hard as it's soft. Oh, this is softer than that one. Visual areas. <coughs> you're getting that information from the retina, which is the back of the eye. And then you have visual association areas, uh, which it's going to use some of your past memories to help interpret. Oh, yeah, I know that's red. Uh, this helps you to recognize faces. With the auditory areas, you have the primary that's interpreting the information that's coming from the inner ear, the loudness, the location, and then the association, auditory association area, is going to store that sound, um, put it into memory. <coughs> the vestibular cortex, uh, this is in the the posterior area of the insula lobe, and this uh, plays a role with helping to um, be aware of your balance. What's the position of your head? Is it straight up or is it tilted towards the side or front or back? The olfactory cortex, this is smell, uh, so the information is coming in and makes you aware of various odors, good, bad, or indifferent. Gustatory, as I said, is taste. Um, at the end of the unit, not with this chapter, but the end of this unit on nervous system, we will be looking a little bit more in depth at some of these special senses of taste, sound, vision, balance. The visceral sensory is that it's going to give you information about, uh, like I said, visual, visceral, think of your internal organs in terms of the abdominal pelvic area. And so that's going to give you sensations of, say, when your bladder is full, when your stomach maybe is a little upset. So this is, once again, just giving some information according to practical applications where you might, you know, have to clinical situations put this into play. Think about it. If you have damage to the primary visual cortex, individuals can be functionally blind. If you have damage to a visual association area, you can still see. You're not blind. You can still see. Can you comprehend and understand what you're looking at? No. You're not able to interpret what this information is. So it's like you're getting all this, this visual information. You can see things, but you can't interpret that that's a tree or that's a flower or you can't interpret it <coughs> they're just things <coughs> excuse me multimodal association areas these are areas where you're getting input from several different sensory areas not just one and then you can coordinate and send out information from these association areas to motor areas to multiple areas so it's just not a, oh, I get input from one area, I send out one area. You're getting it from multiple areas. This allows us to make a much more coordinated response. It allows you to draw upon your memory. You can store things in memory. Um, and then you can pull from those memories. Oh, last time I did this, I did that, and the outcome wasn't so good. So let me change my outcome. It makes you aware of sensations and thoughts. It makes you aware of your emotions and your conscious um, consciousness. It makes a lot of the behavior and personality of what makes you you.
The anterior association area is also called the prefrontal cortex. It's the most complicated. It involves your intellect. It involves cognition, recall, personality. It contains part of your working memory that you need to have to reason things out, to make good judgment calls, to help plan things. Um, it helps you kind of respond appropriately to your social interaction. The posterior association area, uh, this is usually involving areas of the temporal, parietal, and occipital lobes, and it helps with recognizing patterns and faces and, and figuring out where you are uh, relative to other locations. Another part of this is the Wernicke areas that helps you to understand written and spoken language. Radicke's area is different from the Broca's area. The Broca's area allows you to give the spoken language. In other words, information comes in for you to say you're, someone is speaking with you right now. For me to be speaking, for you to understand what I'm saying. Now, I'm not necessarily saying understand the concept, context of this material. What I'm saying that you understand when I say the word... Uh, understand. You know what that word means. When I say, okay, we're going to the next slide, you understand, okay, she's going to flip to the next slide. You're able to understand that. The Broca area allows you to develop and actually, if we were in a face-to-face -face setting, to say, wait, 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 I'm not ready. I don't understand. What are you saying? You're speaking a different language. It allows you to vocalize that. To give you an example, I have a cousin who has a son who <clears throat> has an infant developing just fine. Pregnancy was fine. You know, it's a newborn. They noticed he was a little bit slower to start talking. He's the youngest of four kids. And sometimes that's tough because initially it's like, okay, um, he's not really talking, but, you know, with three older siblings, number one, he can't probably get a word in edgewise. And number two, he doesn't really have to talk because they were so excited and everybody's doing everything for him. He starts to whimper. They grab the, the sippy cup or whatever. But they, uh, they did realize that and started asking, you know, he's not speaking as quickly. He would speak a little bit, but not very much. Bottom line is they finally were able to determine, and thankfully they, they did catch it fairly early on, and they were in a situation where they were able to get help very early on for him. He could understand when you speak to him, but he has problems then putting into words his response. So in his case, they were able to finally to determine the Renegade area is fine. He understands when you talk to him. Once he started to learn to read, he can read just fine. But they're, and they don't know why or how it happened. You know, who knows? They'll probably never know. Uh, but there was uh, some damage to the Broca's area. For whatever reason, it didn't develop properly. And that's the area that's abnormal. He understands when you're talking to him, but he cannot put into a spoken response. He knows what he wants to say, but he cannot put it into words. What they did very when they realized this very early on, the entire family learned sign language. And so that's really his, his, what you would consider his primary language, American Sign Language. So he, he can sign and communicate fine that way. He can write fine. He cannot speak very well. The Limbic Association area. <coughs> um, this involves several different parts and the long nerves pass through this area and it gives an emotional connotation. It helps to establish memories of things. Um, 
some of the nerves for auditory pass through here, some of your nerves for uh, taste and smell will pass through here, which is why you tend to put an emotional context or connotation on different, say, foods by the taste, by the smell of it. Uh, once again, good, bad, or indifferent. Um, but you, you tend to put this emotional um, context on things when those nerve axons are going to pass through the limbic area because that does give some emotion to it. <coughs> if there is a tumor or some type of lesion in the anterior association area, it can cause different personality disorders. Uh, it can cause things like loss of inhibition, problems with attentiveness. Uh, basically, if some of these individuals who may suffer from having a tumor in the, this area, um, it, their behavior becomes what's often described as, oh, they have lost their filter. They don't know how to um, behave what would be considered social norms. They may start taking excessive risk. Uh, so some of them see an extreme behavior change. It's like, mm, what's going on with this area? If there is damage in the posterior association area, <coughs> you may have issues with um, having problems knowing your sense of self and space. Um, in other words, it might be where an individual is... Um, Say a guy might be shaving on the right side of his face, but not on the left, because he, he doesn't associate the left side of his face. Like, that's not part of me anymore. There's this dissociation that has occurred. Lateralization basically refers to the division of labor. The hemispheres are not identical. And most people tend to... Uh, have a dominance of one side over the other. Uh, when we talk about cerebral dominance, it's going to refer to the hemisphere that is uh, dominant for language. 90% of humans have left-sided dominance, which means they're usually right-handed. The other 10% it's reversed. If they have right-sided dominance, they, they tend to be left-handed. The left hemisphere tends to control more of the language, the math, very logical. The right hemisphere is more uh, visual, spatial skills, uh, very artistic usually, very musical, more emotion, more intuition. Now, the hemispheres are going to be communicating with each other, but there's a dominance for one or the other. Your cerebral white matter, this is the second of those three basic regions. So we have already talked about the cortex. So now we're moving in deeper. The white matter is responsible for the communication between the different areas of the cerebral hemisphere and between the cortex and the lower portion of the central nervous system. Um, it's comprised of your myelinated axons, <coughs> those fibers. The axons are going to be classified according to the direction on how they run. Where are they starting? Where are they ending? They are going to be classified as one of three types, association, commissural, or uh, projection fibers. The association fibers, these are ones that are going to be uh, oriented in such a way that they're running horizontally. They connect different parts of the same hemisphere. Commissural fibers are going to be running horizontally, but they will connect one hemisphere to the other hemisphere. And then the projection fibers, these tend to be vertical. They will connect the hemispheres down to other areas of the brain or even to the spinal cord. So over here in red, we have the association, or reddish pink, uh, association fibers. So see how they will connect from one area to another.
but within the same hemisphere. They don't cross over. The commissural ones shown here in green, they do cross over. Where do they cross over? They're going to cross over in what's known as the corpus callosum. That is what connects one side to the other side. That's where those commissural uh, fibers move. And then in purple here, you can see all these projection fibers. They will then move down. They're moving here in this area right here. <coughs> Excuse me, it's the pons, part of the brainstem. And then down here is the medulla, another area, part of the the brainstem. And over here you've got your uh, cerebrum, or excuse me, your cerebellum. So some of them may cross. You don't see on the back side that something cross there. So do they connect within on the same side of the uh, hemisphere? Do they cross from one side to the other? Or do they move to other areas of the brain? And this is just another viewpoint so that you can see from a sagittal viewpoint here, the association stays within, commissural passes from one to the other, and the projection ones move down. And on this one, you can see a little bit better on how it's going to be moving down to the pons, to the medulla, and on down. And then over here is your uh, cerebellum. The basal nuclei also known as the ganglia, is going to be uh, the third part. We have your cortex, you've got these association areas, and then you've, uh, which contains the white matter, and then you've got the basal nuclei. <clears throat> these are going to uh, play roles in things such as determining muscle movement. They play a role also with emotion and cognition. Uh, they kind of filter out inappropriate responses. They inhibit unnecessary movements. Uh, Parkinson's disease and Huntington's disease are disorders that do affect the basal nuclei, which is why you tend to, if this is something to control very nice, to get so you have a nice smooth control regulated movement, which is why you tend to get the tremors when that has been affected. The diencephalon, so that's it for the uh, cerebrum. The next part that we're going to be looking at for the brain is the diencephalon. It is composed of the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the epithalamus. All three of these enclose or surround the third ventricle, which is where cerebral spinal fluid is. <coughs> so all of this up here is the cerebrum. And you know, one thing I want to say, having the gyri or the, the ridges, this increases surface area. Ever think about that? It allows a lot more surface area. Your thalamus is over here, excuse me, which is this um, kind of oval shaped, lighter purple structure that is the thalamus. The, as we go through, the hypothalamus, hypo below it, so it's going to be kind of in front and below it, and then, <coughs> excuse me, the epithalamus, one of the major things right here is kind of underneath the thalamus, and it's going to contain what's known as the pineal gland. So the thalamus, it's kind of that oval shape or egg shaped. Uh, it helps to form part of the walls of the th that third ventricle, as I said. That's the majority in terms of mass of the diencephalon. Uh, it does have fibers that it's getting from the cerebral cortex. It's often considered like a, a relay station because a lot of the nerve fibers going from the spinal cord up to the cerebrum have to pass through the thalamus. And then coming from the cerebrum back down to the spinal cord or other areas of the brain has to pass through it. So it's, it's a relay station. Impulses coming from the hypothalamus are going to be for regulating some of your visceral functions and emotions. Um, it's going to help send some information to the cerebellum. It's going to be involved some with memory. So it's 
it really is a relay station. It's going to help um, interpret and, and, and regulate. You've got all this uh, sensation coming in. It's going to help direct everything to the right spot and then kind of help direct the response for an appropriate response. The hypothalamus is below the thalamus. Um, once again, all the parts of the, the uh, diencephalon are helping to enclose the third ventricle. Uh, it does contain what's known as the mammary uh, bodies that are going to be involved with the olfactory or smell. Um, at the bottom of the hypothalamus is the infipedulum, which is a stalk. It's going to connect to the pituitary gland. The hypothalamus uh, helps really in maintaining homeostasis. It's like the main control center for that. Um, the hypothalamus is one of those structures that has multiple functions. Yes, it's part of the nervous system, but it's also part of the endocrine system. And so a lot of information coming in to the brain relative to maintaining homeostasis, maintaining that equilibrium. What are the calcium levels? What's the pH of the blood? What's the sodium levels? What's the carbon dioxide levels? A lot of that information is coming to the hypothalamus. And then it's like the hypothalamus is sort of this control center. Okay, what are we going to do about the low uh, calcium? What are we going to do about, oh, it looks like we're getting dehydrated. And then it sends out uh, oftentimes responses as its role in the nervous system. It's it's controlling and receiving this information, but then its response sometimes is more via the endocrine system in directing which hormones need to be secreted or inhibited to bring everything back into that homeostatic balance. What are we going to do that calcium levels are low? We need to secrete this hormone so we get the appropriate response to get the calcium levels back up. It helps to control the autonomic nervous system regulating things like blood pressure, blood rate, um, what's the size of your pupil, allowing light in. It is part of the limbic system, so it is going to respond to emotions. It can perceive things like pleasure, but also fear. The hypothalamus is going to help regulate temperature Hunger, are you full or are you feeling hungry? Water balance, sleep wake cycles. So like I said, all of this is going to be controlled um, in its role with the endocrine system. Now, some of the responses to this also will involve the nervous system. <coughs> it does actually produce two hormones, which then it, um, it secretes and it gets stored into what's known as the posterior pituitary gland, which is attached to it. If there are disturbances or problems, abnormalities with the hypothalamus, you can have several different disorders. You can have obesity. You could have sleep uh, disturbances. You could become dehydrated. There could be emotional balances. So the, the hypothalamus is probably what I would recommend to you is probably considered like one of the main homeostatic control centers. And if you don't maintain homeostasis, I mean, that's maintaining your internal balance of everything. So if that gets off, you're in trouble. The epithalamus, most important thing with this is that it does contain the pineal gland. Now, this is also an endocrine gland. And as far as the hormones that are produced, Along this, we will study again with the endocrine system. Uh, but the pineal gland, it secretes melatonin. It does play a role with your sleep-wake cycle. So once again, <coughs> excuse me, here is your thalamus up here, hypothalamus. And when I was talking about the uh, down here, it's going to be your uh, pituitary gland and then the pineal gland is this little itty bitty thing right back here underneath the thalamus. 
The brain stem is composed of the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. Oftentimes it's just called the medulla. Um, the medulla is going to become continuous with the spinal cord. So the brain stem connects basically your spinal cord to the rest of the brain. Um, the brain stem in general controls a lot of your automatic behaviors. So you don't have conscious control over. These are behaviors that are necessary for survival. Things like respiration rate, uh, heart rate, things like that. And this is showing a really kind of a nice view. Uh, <coughs> here is the midbrain. The pons, the pons kind of looks like a swelling, an enlarged area kind of off one side. And then here is below that is the medulla and then your spinal cord. So you can see the medulla. It's a little bit um, wider than the spinal cord. So you have this little bit of enlargement here and then your spinal cord. And these, if you're wondering what these are, these are cranial nerves. We will study those that are extending off. And new gland will play a role in pain suppression and also in the fight or flight. Um, and they're going to be involved with some of the other cranial nerves as well. The midbrain um, nuclei, they're going to be scattered throughout. One thing that we have are the corpora uh, quadrilegium, this, the superior one deals with visual reflexes and the inferior deals with auditory relay centers. <coughs> Excuse me, the pons, the fourth ventricle separates the pons from the, the cerebellum. You have longitudinal fibers that are running through the pons that connect higher brain centers with the spinal cord and then the transverse or dorsal fibers are relaying uh, over to the cerebellum. This is where um, additional of your cranial nerves, uh, five, six, and seven are start at the pons. <coughs> but we'll look at those later. Pons also plays a role with helping with your normal rhythm of breathing. The medulla, uh, as you saw, does become continuous with the spinal cord. It contains the fourth ventricle. Um, <coughs> it contains choroid plexus which uh, help the choroid plexus help to form the cerebral spinal fluids. There are different structures of the medulla, the pyramids of these two ridges, um, and then you have where the, the pyramid tracks cross over from one side to the other. So this is where you now have all those fibers coming up from the right side, up coming up from the spinal cord. The right side, they cross, desiccation means it's a point where it crosses over to the left side. So when we talk about how the uh, left side of the brain controls the right body, well, where did those fibers cross over? It's at this point right here at the pyramids. And then you have additional of your cranial nerves that originate here. Some of what the medulla is also controlling are things like equilibrium, and it certainly is a relay station because everything coming up the spinal cord has to pass through it. The medulla is involved with autonomic reflex center, so a lot of the functions, it's, it's fine-tuning things that are going to the hypothalamus. It certainly is going to play a role with heart rate. The force that the heart is contracting. Uh, it can adjust blood vessel diameter, which is going to play a role in adjusting the blood pressure. It has respiratory centers where it's helping to generate that rhythm for your breathing, controlling the rate, controlling the depth of the breathing. <coughs> it can also control other things such as vomiting, hiccuping, swallowing, sneezing, coughing. The bottom line is between the medulla and the pons and the midbrain, helping to control such vital survival functions. Hopefully now you've been thinking in the back of your mind, ooh, brain stem injury, we're talking whether you survive or not.
very, very critical if there's damage there. And then the cerebellum. This is located behind the pons of the medulla. Uh, it's getting input from the cortex, from the brainstem. It's helping to provide very coordinated movements of the skeletal muscles so that it's not just some jerky, spastic type of movement. It also plays a role with balance. It is divided into two hemispheres, um, certainly not as large as the cerebrum. The connection, now the corpus callosum is what we call the connection uh, between your cerebellar hemispheres, cere cerebral hemispheres, if I can talk, <coughs> excuse me. The two hemispheres of the cerebellum are connected by what's known as the vermis. And then each of those hemispheres are divided into three lobes. The gray matter, once again, is on the outside, just like you saw with the cerebrum. The white matter is internal with the cerebellum. The white matter internally is much thinner, and there's a lot of branching, and it, it literally looks like a tree, so it's called the arborvitae, which in Latin means the tree of life. And if you do a dissection of it, that's what it actually looks like. <coughs> the Purkinje fibers do originate in the cortex area. They synapse with the uh, cerebellum. And, and so you can see the location of the cerebellum relative to the rest of the brain. And then, like I say, this cross section here, you can see right here the white matter, that arbor vitae. It, literally looks like here's the trunk and the branches off of it. And this is just another view. The vermis, as we said, which connects the two uh, hemispheres together. And this shows well that you can kind of see. So here's the vermis. And you can see different lobes. So I said that the cerebellum is going to fine tune, get nice coordinated, smooth muscle uh, movements. So that obviously is involving your voluntary muscle contractions. Um, it's helping you with equilibrium and balance. Um, there is some uh, evidence that. It's suggesting that the cerebellum may play a role in thinking, language, and emotion. How much, we don't know, but it, there is some new evidence that is indicating that.